Right, hello and welcome to those joining us on YouTube. You are about 30 seconds behind. We have a chat room full of people in our connect room. Uh, and we will be good to go in seconds, in seconds. All I need to do is make sure that the YouTube people can see my screen. So let's make sure that's been broadcast. That looks fine. And then we need my slides. Then I am good to go. But I'm working blind. So I have an assistant with me, luckily, who will pass on any questions. So uh, you can get those questions to me via the Connect Room, via Twitter. Uh, you'd probably see them on Facebook, wouldn't you? Something like that. I'm hoping. I'm hoping anyway. So let me get uh, this show on the road. And hello, officially, and welcome to tonight's demonstration. And it is Affinity Photo. And for those who don't know, uh, I'm Elaine Giles, trainer for a long, long time, far longer than I want to admit, and I currently present the MacBytes podcast. Now, this session is being provided by MacBytes Learning, which is an extra to the MacBytes podcast. And that was because we, we got lots of questions uh, when we were talking Mac about how to do certain things. And because we're trainers, it seemed like a logical way to go. Now, we started this journey last year just under 12 months ago when we looked at an application called Affinity Designer. Now, I'm going to challenge you to a drinking game tonight. You're going to enjoy this. The app we're looking at tonight is called Affinity Photo. But because I've been using Affinity Designer for a year, I am bound to refer to it numerous times as Affinity Designer. And every time I do, Mike will shout, drink. Ah, so you should be... um. Pretty happy by the end of this, but I will attempt to uh, keep it on track and remember that it's Affinity Photo and not Affinity Designer. Now, I said what we do is compare it to Photoshop, Pixelmator and Acorn. The ones that um, are already, well, Photoshop's not an alternative to Photoshop, but Pixelmator's been claimed to be an alternative to Photoshop, as has Acorn. So really, it's where does Affinity Photo stand in regard to that? Can you finally say you don't need Photoshop anymore? So that's it for me prattling about it. Let's actually have a look at it now. And oh, there we go. Affinity photo. And that should open up nicely. Now, let me get that full screen. Now, if you've not seen Photoshop, then it won't matter to you that this looks very similar to Photoshop. But if you have seen Photoshop, I will just show you Photoshop. Aren't they similar? In fact, Photoshop's interface is a little bit more muted than um, Affinity Designer, but very similar. If you know your way around Photoshop, you will no doubt be able to find your way around Affinity Photo. So let's show you what you've actually got. Across the top, you have the standard toolbar, which changes depending on the mode that you're in and the tool that you have active. So again, very familiar to Photoshop, very similar to Pixelmator as well, in a way. If you've not seen Pixelmator, let me show you Pixelmator. That is Pixelmator. Now, the difference with Pixelmator is it tends to float over the, the desktop. It floats over the background. And that can be somewhat disorientating. Um, I must admit, I find that a little bit odd. I find all the tools moving around. So I actually do like things locked away in an interface. But uh, that's an option with Pixelmator. But those are the alternatives. But tonight it's Affinity Photo. So the tools that you would be used to in any application that you already use for image editing would be down the left hand side. And here they are. They are not identical, but there is certainly a lot of overlap with tools that you will be familiar with if you've used anything. So literally, if you've used Photoshop, Photoshop Express, um, Photoshop Elements, Pixelmator, Acorn, any of them, even PaintShop Pro, any of those. And these will become familiar. On the right hand side, you actually have quite a lot of interface elements. You've got standard stuff like the histogram. but You've also got color and swatches and brushes. And more commonly, if you tend to use Photoshop, you've got your layers. But you also have in here adjustments and effects and styles. So the interface, I think, is it's, it's a progression, I would say, from Photoshop. It's very Mac like. It's really been written with the Mac in mind, whereas Photoshop, of course, has to be cross-platform. That's one of its huge selling points that it is actually cross-platform. So I'm opening up a folder and eventually I'm hoping to see that that folder will actually open. It's having one of those nights this and it should be on this side of the screen. So if you saw something whip past, that was me. 
OK, so I thought we'd start at the beginning. Always a good place to start because one concept that you need to understand right from the beginning is that Affinity Photo has different modes. Now, they don't use the term modes. They use the term personas. And those personas are here in the top right hand corner. And what you've got there is the photo persona. And as you move along, the liquify persona sounds terrifying, but it's not. Then the develop persona and then finally the export export persona. And the idea of these is that the interface changes to tools that will help you get that specific job done. So if you think about it, when you're trying to export an image, you don't need tools to edit it at that point. And if you're trying to develop a photo, a raw image, you're not editing it either at that point, and nor are you trying to export it. You're trying to focus on developing the image and getting the best colours from it. So as you switch between these modes, the tools available, oh, I can't show you that at the moment, I haven't got anything open, but these will change and the tools available will change. So what I will do, I will open an image and the image that I've got is a raw file. And if you've been with us many years ago, you may have seen this image, you'll remember it, it was horrible. What it is, is a CR2 image, so a Canon RAW file. And I'm going to open that in Affinity Photo. So how I'm going to do that is double click it and go to open with and Affinity Photo will be listed there and that will open it up. Now, it's a RAW file. It does not need to go through any conversion first. What you'll see has happened in this top left hand corner is that it has changed to the develop persona. The tools available on the left hand side have changed. The tools available on the, the toolbar at the top have changed and the options you have available on the right has changed. So that's why the personas are critical, because they will they will change depending on what's relevant for you to have at that actual point. And if you're hearing two of me, that's Mike playing around. <laughs> I've no idea what he's doing. OK, now, if you've used Photoshop or you have used anything with your raw files before, you'll be aware that your raw files need to be developed. And for that, Photoshop has always had the, um, many tools for doing that. There's also Lightroom where you can take your files in in batches. What this is focusing on is processing a single image and letting you get down to the granular level of control that you would need. And it didn't need to convert it to anything else for, at first. It's working on the Canon RAW image. And as you can see, it's not the best photo. That's as it was shot. In my defence, it was about 5.30 in the morning in October and it wasn't the best of days. But because it's a RAW file, although if I'd saved it as a JPEG in the camera, that's what it would have looked like. Because it's a RAW file, I can actually tease out a lot more detail from it and improve the colour. In fact, I can do an awful lot with it. So let's have a look how to do that. First of all, you have your tools down the left hand side. So you could zoom in and actually look at part of the image um, that you need to focus on. So we don't need to do that yet. If there is red eye in the image, you can remove it with a dedicated red eye tool. You can also remove blemishes. Now, it, this is not a replacement for blemish removal later and all the tools with content aware fill. It's literally just if the, you had dust on the camera or dust on the lens. And it's brilliant at doing that. Um, and then you, you've got other tools in here where you can uh, overlay and you can use erase tools. You've got gradient overlays. You can crop the image. So there's a lot of tools over there to work with. Over on this side, on the right hand side, there are a collection of tabs, which if you've used any application that processes raw, they will be familiar to you. Um, you've got your white point, black point, brightness. So really all the things that you can do to this image. And this is where I would start with this. Obviously, it's grossly underexposed. So the first thing to do is change the exposure and bring back a little bit more of the detail. Doing that will wash out the colour considerably, but it's so dark that I need to do that first. Then you can alter the black point so you can bring back some uh, darkness to it or you can take that black point right down and actually make it look like daylight. Uh, not the sunniest day, but daylight rather than that um, dusk morning. So I think I, I wouldn't move that too far. 
Then you've got the brightness. So again, you can ramp the brightness up if you need to. Or you can take it back the other way. Now, obviously, we need more brightness rather than less. So it's looking better already in terms of we can actually see what it is now. It's Olympia Station in London. But it's not looking great in terms of colour saturation. There's also other problems with this, which can't be fixed on the basic tab, but I will be fixing as I go in there. The next section is enhance. And what enhance will allow you to do is really to take it a step further and improve this image in terms of its contrast, its clarity, its saturation and its vibrance. And it certainly needs some of that. Con contrast wise, I don't think it's too bad. Um, if I show you what difference you get, if you take the contrast out, it goes very muddy, very milky. You take it too far the other way and it's a little bit too punchy. It's a little bit too black and white, too stark. So I think somewhere around the midpoint for the contrast is about right for this image. Who knows what clarity does? And if you're with us, who knows what clarity does? Uh, because this clarity at the moment is right down the left hand side. If I take it across where I would say you would see what clarity does is around these bricks here. If I show you around the bricks. So if I take that clarity back, you may have heard of clarity as an unsharp mask. It's actually sharpening it up. It can make it a little bit too much. It can make the edges a little bit cartoonish. So I'd be very careful with clarity. Don't take it too far. You can always come back and change these later. So it's not too much of a problem to change them later. What's concerning me is the lack of colour. Uh, the sky is very overcast and the rest of it is just blah. So I want to bring back some saturation in here. I need to add to the saturation. And if I start to add colour to that, you can see it's picking up the red of the train. It's picking up the red and the yellow of the flowers. So it's really starting to bring colour into it. The buildings here have got beautiful brickwork and it's picking that up. And then I can alter the vibrance. So if I take that across, that will carry on doing that. So it will actually start to pick up some digital noise in it as well. You'll notice around the red here, it's starting to get digital noise in it because I'm actually ramping it up so much. This image, though, is a raw image. And because of that, it's huge. And I could actually probably get a decent print out of that, even if it's got a little bit of noise in it. And I can continue to use these tools and the tools in Affinity Photo to reduce the noise later. So colour wise, um, it's looking a lot better. It's actually got some colour in it that uh, it needed. It really did need. You can alter the white balance and you can adjust the shadows and highlights. So if there were some, there are some shadows in this, but actually they're more highlights now. Uh, you can actually make those lighter or darken those. So again, I don't think this needs too much in the way of shadows and highlights. But it has got fundamental problems still with it. The sky actually had more detail as it was. Now, you probably can't remember that and neither can I. But luckily, there are some tools in Affinity Photo that are fantastic for this. If I go up to the top there, this gives me a before and after view. If I just show you that down there, there's actually a before and after little tab on that slider. And when you hover over that slider and you move it, it literally gives you the before and the after and you can decide where that is. And that's showing me that the clouds actually look better before I started. Uh, but the rest of it didn't look too great. So uh, the rest of it's looking good. Just need to bring back some detail in the clouds there. So I think that's a fabulous feature. I really, really love that. The other alternative you've got with that. So there's three alternatives. You can either see what you're working on. You can see half of each and a slider or you can see both as you're working. So you can look back at it that that way. You'd know what you're aiming for and how far off you are from it. But I'm going to move that over here. So we're just working on this one image. Right now, one of the things I need to do with this is it's actually got a lens problem with it, which is this sign here is leaning to the left. And you really notice that when you go into crop the image, because when you go into the crop, it puts um, an overlay on it. And you can see that the line here on the right, it really is bending in towards it. So that really shows you how bad the lens was on that. Luckily, you can change that in post as well, which a lot of people find really strange. But you can. You can change the distortion on the lens, the horizontal, vertical, rotation and scale. Now, I suggest you choose one way to do this and stick with it. 
because there is another way to straighten the image, which is to actually use the crop tool and elect to straighten with a straighten tool. And then you can actually say, I want it straight along that edge there and that would rotate it back for you. So that's one way to do it. Using the rotation in the lens tab is another way to do it. So just be aware there's two ways to do it. I'm going to undo that and I'm going to do it in the lens tab. So I'll just show you what this does. If I move that across, it's actually pulling that towards you in like a reverse fisheye lens look. And if I go the other way, you see it's doing the other things. So how do I know what's right? Well, you can get lens profiles. So if you have a lens, it will have specific settings and they will be across the board. So you could get a lens profile and that way the correction on the lens will be the same every photo that that lens takes. Alternatively, you can just do it by eye, just do it by sight. Um, I don't think with that it needs much in the way of distortion. So I would leave that the same. But it probably does need something changing here. And that's tipping it backwards. So I don't need that on this image. But I do need a little bit of rotation and it's not going to need much. Just a little bit to take that back. And I think that's probably enough, which is just under one uh, degree there. So not much at all, but enough to bring in a problem, which is along the bottom edge and along the right hand edge. You can see there that you've actually got transparent pixels now, because as you've rotated it behind the image, there's nothing. Now, what you would normally do with that is either crop it out or you would leave it and then try and fill it later and try and make it match. You have got one option in here that saves you the job, which is the lowest option here, which is scale. And when you do that, just make it a fraction bigger. So 0.2, so it's 2% there, just 2% bigger. And that's fine. It's filled that gap in and I don't have to worry about it. Now you can then go on to details, which I'm going to leave alone on this one. Uh, you've got tones, which again, I'm going to leave alone on this one. What I want to do is show you overlays. Um, so far, everything I've done has applied to the entire image. Uh, what I'd like to do is to have something that is not applying to the entire image, which is bring in a linear gradient here. So I'm clicking and dragging down. What I'm attempting to do with that is getting it just over that sky. Now, what that does is the ruby mask that you have there, that's going to be the only place that the changes I make now apply. So if you're familiar with Photoshop and its concepts, you'll be aware that that sounds like a mask and it is a mask in a way, it's a, an overlay. So over here in the overlays, you have a choice. You can now click master and any changes will apply to the entire image or you click on gradient overlay and the changes will only apply where that gradient overlay is. So going back to basic, you saw that I moved saturation and vibrance all the way across to the right. And now they're back to where they were. That's because I'm editing just where this overlay is. And in this case, I probably do want to take up some of the saturation in there. And I probably do want to take up some of the vibrance, get some detail back. And I probably actually want to change the exposure. So it's probably a little bit bright and I'm losing the clouds. If I take it back a bit, and bring back some of those clouds. And with this, you don't have to have it straight. You can have it coming in from the side. So as I move that, you can see it actually affects the background there. So it's very dark on the right or very dark on the left, or you can have it in the middle. Now, I think it works better darker from the left. And you've added more detail. So let's have a look at the before and the after now. Yeah, now we've got the detail back that we didn't have before. We'd lost all that beautiful detail and we've now got it back, but we've replaced that murky blue with a much brighter blue. So we've got the best of both worlds there. So that is the raw processing that you've got on there. You could take that a lot further or you could now take this image into Affinity Photo and do the editing in there. And you do that by clicking the develop button. So up in the top left hand corner, you have cancel, which will just undo all of that hard work you've just done, or it will develop the image and take the image into Affinity Photo. It will not change your original at this point. It will just take it into Affinity Photo. Now, first thing to notice is what it's done. It's taken you back to this photo persona, which is where all of the action takes place. 
This is where all of the tools are available and you can then carry on working with this. So any changes that you wanted to make to this, you could do that in here. And it now works exactly the same way as any normal JPEG or TIFF image that you've got. It's just that this is your raw file that you're working on. Now, what I would then do with that is save, but I would save as and I would choose to save that as an Affinity Photo photo. So it's having a good old think about it. Well, it cranks up all of my drives. And what I would like it to do here is not go over there. I would like it to uh, let me save it to my desk. I've had a good old think about it, isn't it? Let's put it on my desktop. Come on. Come on. Oh, it's not doing a thing. Don't you love it when that happens? Go on, have a think about it. Don't stress yourself at all. Right, there we go. So I will save that to the desktop. And that one is saved. Right, let me go and have a look what we've got next. So that was working with raw images and your develop persona. Now, once you've got an image in here, you're going to need to do things with it. So I picked some of the common things that you would probably do with images. And um, let's have a look at those. So I am working off screen here and trying to get it to, to open up an image. And uh, I'm not having that much luck. Oh, it's very upset tonight. Right. Where's Affinity Photo? Come on. Let's open up that one. Oh, good. You are thinking about it. Fabulous. Right. OK, then. So what we've got here is red eye, as you can see, and pretty obvious red eye at that. Now, you actually have a whole range of tools for editing your images in specific ways. And uh, they are down here. So let me show you what you've got. You've got the healing brush, the patch tool, the blemish removal, the in-painting brush tool and a red eye removal tool. Now, I don't know about you, but when these came in a few, few years ago now, uh, to say they were hit and miss was an understatement. So let's have a look how this one copes. Now, all you need to do with it is draw around the area with the red eye. So draw around it. And as you can see, it's square. So I'm not being that precise either. I'm just drawing around it. So draw around that. And you're not thinking about doing a thing now, are you? Come on. Oh, something has got upset here. Everything's running very slowly. There we go. So all I did was draw around it. And all I'm going to do with that one is draw around it. And I think that is pretty good. That is very, very accurate. All this tool is doing is removing the red in that area. So I have another image to show you that uh, should make it clearer what it's actually doing. This one has got red eye, but it's a more of an artistic red eye. Uh, the red eye that it's got is deliberate. So this one is um, an artistic image. What are you doing? Dear me. Come on. There we go. So this one, this this red eye has been added after the event. Um, those eyes were probably green or brown, and that is an, a change that's been made. But I'm going to do exactly the same with this image. So just draw around those eyes there and you'll see it does remove the red that's in there because it's working. Oh, it should be. Hang on. Let's take that away and get the red eye tool. And there we go. It's taking a little bit of it away. And all I'm going to do is just keep drawing around it until it gets the message but I want to lose the lot. <gasps> it's not doing it, is it? Why aren't you doing it? OK, I'll click instead. This is another way to do it. You can actually click on the areas that you want to get uh, remove the red. Now you can see it's down to orange, but if I carry on clicking, it will keep taking it away until I have got rid of all of it. It should let me do this by drawing around it. I do not know what's the matter with it, but it's also running fairly slow as well. So what I'm doing is just clicking in those areas and doing it manually doing it by hand. So you can see that all it's doing is taking away the red. For that reason, this is not the tool if you want to cure red eye, in massive air quotes, in animals, because red eye in animals tends to be green or a yellow colour. This is not the tool for that. You would have to do that by hand. So that's using it for red eye. Now, whenever I demonstrate Photoshop, there is always this topic and people absolutely love it. And that is content aware fill. So who has used content aware fill? Let me know in the chat. I know we've got people with us tonight who are using content aware fill. How many we got in there? Everybody? Yes, virtually everybody. 
Oh, love content aware fill. It came into Photoshop a while ago and it was pretty accurate when it came in. Happy to say it's even better now than it was then. So what I've got, I'm opening up a folder and um, let's have a look what we've got. I'm going to start with something really simple, really simple, and then go on to something more complicated. Let's see if it'll open it up that way. Oh, good. Right. This one is really simple. All I want to remove is this here, which is in the middle there. So I want to zoom in so you can see it. I would be if you want to let me zoom. There we go. I just want that removed. And there's lots of different ways that I could do that because if we go back to the red eye tool and click and hold, I've got the healing brush, I've got the patch tool, the blemish removal and the in-painting brush tool. Now, the thing is, which one do you use when? Well, it depends. The healing brush tool is for smaller areas. The patch tool is quite fun. So uh, let's try that. I'm going to undo that. So it'll let me do it. And hopefully all right, what I'm going to do in order that I can show you the before and the after, I've created another layer. But if I start working now, nothing's going to happen because up here it says current layer and current layer and below. And if I don't choose current layer and below, I'll be working with just empty pixels. Then the trickiest thing is actually to draw around it. And that I do find sometimes a little bit hit and miss. But what I do is I move around and it fills it with where I actually am. So that's not too bad. If I clicked on there and then Command and D to do. Oh, you didn't do that very well, did you? Let's go back to that. Yeah, let's find a good spot. So just move around until you find a good spot. And yeah, it's got it. Oh, no, it's not doing it, is it? Ah, no, this is why I use a different tool entirely. I find that difficult to work around. What I do find fabulous is the in painting brush tool. This one I find brilliant. And again, make sure that if you've got a separate layer that you're working on the current layer and below. And this one is the nearest you'll find to content aware fill, which is just draw over what you don't want and it's gone. As simple as that. Let me zoom out so you can see that it was there and now it's gone. But people say to me, yeah, but that's really easy because it's on a fairly plain background and there's only, there's only a tiny area. And you're right, that's where Photoshop used to trip up. Uh, if you wanted something bigger getting rid of, like this tree down here and the bush next to it, it was all a bit tricky. Um, how well it did would really depend. It would depend on how well you made a selection and it would depend on how, what mood Photoshop was in because it was random. And uh, you could do it once and it didn't work at all. You could do it again and it worked brilliantly. And as far as you could see, it was the same. So in here, I'm uh, using the square bracket keys to make the brush bigger because I need to go all the way around that. But I'm not being very precise. I'm not doing anything clever. I'm just using a mouse. It's not a Wacom tablet. And I'll just get that bit in over there. And then I just release it. It has a think about it and it processes it and that was terrible but do you know what in rehearsals it worked brilliantly oh, which is what I said it can be random so let's give it another try that doesn't work I've got another image but go on you, you worked brilliantly yesterday you know you did oh that's not bad it's better so do it twice if you need to and then what I'd be tempted to do with this little bit down here it's not quite even so you have another tool which is the stamp tool what that enables you to do is to select a from point and then move and paste it onto a to point. And again, you need to make sure that that is current layer and below. And you can see I've now got it on my brush. I put that in the right place and click. And as I move along, there we go. Now, if you've got something like that where the sky, I can just about see the sky and it's not quite right, then I would do that over it. And let's have a look at the full version. And not bad at all. I don't know whether to try this next bit <laughs> because, as I say, it worked perfectly when I tried it yesterday. But I will, I will. I will attempt to remove this big tree, which is alarmingly close to the tree next to it. But I'll give it a go anyway. So again, same principle. Just draw around it. In terms of how far around it, enough so you can say I've got a little bit of the edge. 
And obviously it's a bit tricky at that point because it's quite close to that tree. But there's lots of blue within it as well. So this is actually trickier than it looks, despite the fact that the background is a, an easy background to work with. I could certainly get rid of this with the stamp tool. But hey, we want to save time. We want it to do it itself and preferably very, very quickly. So let's see what it makes of it. Don't make a liar out of me again. He's thinking about it. There we go. Not bad at all. All I'd need to do is make my brush smaller and literally just click once on each of the spots that's left behind to get rid of them. And then let's zoom out and have a look at that. Perfect. Ah, that was much better than, than the bush, which was easier yesterday. It's got one on itself today. So that one was an easy one. But what if it's not so easy? Because, you know, if it's easy like that, then you probably find another way to do it and you won't worry about it. But there are things that aren't that easy because what you're trying to remove is integrated into the entire photo. So what I'll do with that is close that and we don't need to save it. Oh, dear. Right, let's try that again. Close. Bye. No, it's not having it. <laughs> there we go. Right. No, don't save. I'll come back and do it again if I want to. Right. So this one much more difficult. And judging by the experience of that one, this could be great fun. OK, this one is indeed much more difficult because what I want to get rid of is the white lines in the road and all these posts. Uh, there's quite a few of them, although there only looks to be one there and one over here. As you go into that image, there's lots of them and they're off in the distance as well. And there's all these white lines. I want to get rid of all of that. So let's start off with the easy bit at the front. And again, what I'm going to do to make sure that it's non-destructive is to add a layer. That's just a blank pixel layer. Then I'm going to get the in-painting tool, which is absolutely brilliant. Love that one. Make sure that you've selected current layer and below. Unfortunately, it doesn't remember that. It always defaults back to the current layer, which I don't like, but because I always use a separate layer. So be aware if nothing happens, that's what the problem is. So just draw over that one, let it have a think about it and it's gone. And that is actually perfect. Looking at that, you cannot tell that is perfect. So what I would then need to do is to zoom in to each of these and do exactly the same thing. Now, I haven't memorised all these shortcut keys yet, but some of them are incredibly familiar to you. Like the zoom tool is the Z key. And handily, which I think is a wonderful feature, if I press Z to go to the zoom key, uh, the zoom tool, and I zoom in with it, and I press Z again, it takes me back to the previous tool, which means I don't have to remember the other tool. As long as I'm working with that and the zoom tool, it will just go backwards and forwards between the two. Love that. That's a huge time saver. And then it's just a matter of making this brush smaller and smaller as I draw over the bits that I don't want. Now, in answer to a question of why don't you just go with a bigger brush and take more out at once? Sadly, it doesn't work like that. If I try doing that next to this yellow line that I want to keep, I'll end up with yellow smudges outside the area. So sometimes it's better to do it in with a smaller brush and do it little by little. OK, let's have a look at progress. Much better. And I can actually show you the before and the after. And this is easy. This is not me doing something that was tricky, which it was five years ago. This is now really easy. So I'll zoom in over here to this post. Now, this is trickier because behind it, you've got different colours. It starts with grass and then it's got sand and then it's got some brown trees and it's got some green bits. So this is trickier. So I'm going to make sure that I've got a brush wide enough just to go over that and just click and drag down over it. And make sure I've got a little bit either side. Let go. And perfect. Can't tell that it was there. And that rock's annoying me. So I'll get rid of that while I'm at it. So that one's gone. So moving across to this one, that one's got such sharp edges, it looks like it was added afterwards. Right. So dropping that down. And that's gone as well. And again, you just can't tell um, what it's done is it's used the pixels of the surrounding area to replace it. But it's done it in such an intelligent way that you just can't tell that it was there. Right. So let's zoom out and have another look. Right. That's not looking too bad now. I could sit here and I could take all of these out, but I, you've probably seen me do that enough now. 
I'll just do the last couple here at the beginning. But they are all as simple as that. It doesn't matter how far away they are. I'll just roughly do those, not even doing them in, in the right way, really. But that's why it's not that it's not as good as the others, because I'm not doing it carefully enough. But as I was zoomed in at this level, I thought, I don't like these things. Can I get rid of these? And I'm going to draw over them. Um, yeah, I'm being relatively careful in terms of, of getting the edges, but not that careful. I'm getting way more in than I need and it's got rid of them. And to get rid of those cables just across the trees, they're gone. And the cables at the top, and they're gone. There are some more over there. So if I make the brush smaller, just whip across there. That's a cable. That's gone as well. I think there's some telegraph poles in the distance. That far in the distance, I can barely make them out. But let's assume that they are indeed telegraph poles, and they're going. So just draw that in there. But then, of course, it gets tricky, because that one's quite big. And it's really quite, it, it's very noticeable in terms of there's very little of it against the sky, but the rest of it is over greens. And this is where it starts to get difficult. How on earth can it discern which green is which that I want to get rid of? Well, if I'm careful enough as I draw over it, again, not that careful that you need to worry about it, but just try not to veer off. So try to keep it in a straight line right down to the bottom. And it's done very, very well. Very well indeed. Oh dear, there's another one. <laughs> there's a lot of these things, isn't there? Now, this one's got a lot of wires on it. I'm going to concentrate first on getting rid of the actual telegraph pole. I will come back to the wires. So just colouring that in there, going out either side here. Now, that is now wider than the brush, so I'm having to make two passes on each of these and then dragging down to the bottom there. Now, I haven't got all of that. I haven't gone down far enough. And it's got confused up here with all these wires, but it's not done too badly. So I'll try and get rid of the wires. Let's try getting rid of that one. And the more of the wires you get rid of, the better it will be, because the fewer wires will be there for it to think, oh, well, you want that there, do you? No, I don't. I actually want to get rid of these wires. That's why I'm choosing to get rid of them together. Normally, it's good practice to take them out one at a time. But if I tell it at this stage, you know, I don't want any of these wires then that would be better. Now, one thing I did notice as I was uh, having a look at this file was if I don't get close enough to just that line and I overrun into the blue bit at the bottom, which is the mountain, it goes very blurry. So I'm deliberately keeping away from the mountain there. OK, let's have a look at that by zooming out a bit. And not bad where I've done, but oh, these wires have come back, haven't they? Because I think there's another one. Ah, uh, is there another one? There is. Look at that there. It's rather a large one as well. OK, let's go in there and let's try and tidy that up completely. So I need to go back to the tool that I had. And it's really just a matter with these of just roughly drawing over them. So not that tricky at all. Just a matter of keeping a steady hand. And I'm about at the edge of my mouse mat. So I managed all that way on my mouse mat, but then I had to move back. So that should get rid of that one. The others will be the same principle, identical. I think you'd probably get away there because I'm running off that, aren't I? I think you'd probably get away there with a bigger brush as well. So I wouldn't say use a huge brush, just use a brush that's big enough to get rid of what you want. And if it leaves any behind, then just go over it again. That one didn't do too badly at all. I'm going to make the brush a little bit bigger for this one, just for speed. And I'll need a bigger brush shortly anyway. Ooh, try that. A little bit wobbly on my part. Mm, and it's thinking about it. OK, you'll be thinking about it in a minute when I start on these. OK, I'll try and get rid of that wire first. That's on its own. So get rid of all of those wires and then start the tricky job of trying to get rid of that entire pole. And that's the most difficult one. It's the most difficult because it's the biggest. And it's mixed up with a tree um, at the bottom. So you can actually see the post here and here. So that one's tricky. So what I'll do is I will zoom out a little bit. So we can see nearly all of it. Might do that in two passes, actually. So let's get back in and get a bigger brush. So I'm going for a brush that will cover all of that. So making sure I've got everything at the top. 
and then working down to the bottom there. I'm going to stop there and uh, get, try and get rid of the top half first and then remove the bottom half later. The more you take away, the more work you ask it to do, the longer it takes. And the rest of it is there down to there. And see what it makes of that. Pretty good. Got rid of all of that. So let's have a look at the whole thing. That is the after. Let's get that in the middle. And that was the before. That was just one tool. It was the in-painting tool and it was really easy. I actually said today to Mike, even you could do that. <laughs> and I got the evil look I'm getting now. <laughs> but it's true. It literally is exactly the same as the brush tool. All you've got to do is draw over what you don't want. You do, of course, you know, you may find that you've got a problem where, you know, it brings in some artifacts or something else that you need to get rid of. I noticed as I was working on that in here, it kind of flattened that out. It left a very awkward join there. And all you need to do with that is just do it again. So wherever you've got a bit of a problem, just go over it and see what it makes of it. And there you go. Now that's perfect. So same tool, not doing anything different with that at all. Exactly the same tool. So that's its equivalent of content aware Phil. Who likes that? Everybody usually likes that. They really do like that. Now, one of the other questions I get asked an awful lot is um, blend modes. Blend modes and selections people like. And we've done a blend modes one before. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to open up this image. And it may be familiar to some of you MacBiters. The lady with the tattoo. Mm. Well, she hasn't got a tattoo at the moment. Uh, but when we were looking at Photoshop Touch, she acquired a tattoo. And there's the tattoo. So let's have a look how this manages tattoos. Now, first of all. Who understands blend modes and who wants to explain them to me? And the answer to that is usually nobody. Anybody rushing forward? No, I thought not. OK, blend modes. I will open up an image and I will show you blend modes. It's not going to be an hour on blend modes. It's literally going to be very quickly. This is how I explain blend modes. Blend modes work on two layers. You have the first layer, which is the layer with the pixels on, in this case, it's this image that you're looking at. And then you have a layer above that. And blend modes determine how the top layer uh, blends with the layer below it. So if I show you another layer, this one just has solid colours on it. And blend modes are available from this drop down here. And they should look familiar to you if you know Photoshop. So I'm making sure I've selected the layer. And you've got darken and darker colour, multiply. So multiply screen, overlay, uh, hard light, soft light. All of these are in Photoshop. And just to show you what they do, it takes the value of the pixel in the top layer and the value of the pixel in the bottom layer. And it performs a mathematical calculation and determines which pixel to show you or how those pixels interact with each other. And in this case, you can see the black one, you see nothing from below because what you're saying with a dark and blend mode is show me the darkest pixel. And with the black one, every single pixel in the black square is going to be darker than the pixel on the layer below. So that's how blend mode work. So if we go back to the tattoo, what does that mean for our tattoo? Well, I'll bring the tattoo in, which is just a PNG. And that PNG has a white background. I need scaling, obviously. So let's scale it a bit. So it's not too big. We can finish it off shortly, but that's it's getting there to the right size. Now, what do, what do we actually need to do with this? Who wants to hazard a guess? Tell me in plain English what we need to do with this as I rotate it and put it in place. And I really mean really plain English. Does anybody actually use the plainest English that I used, Mike? Get rid of the white. Yes, that's exactly what I said. Get rid of the white. OK, if I want to do that, anybody want to hazard a guess at the blend mode? And I'll give you a clue. What pixels I want to see are the black pixels. Not the white ones. I want to see the pixels below on her arm that are give you the biggest clue, darker than the white pixels. Is that helping at all? Or are we still at the guessing stage? No. no. Graham's typing. 
Oh, oh, I'll wait. Luminosity. Oh, luminosity. Let's have a look what luminosity will do. Uh, no T-shirt, Graham. No T-shirt, sadly. <laughs> Not luminosity. You want to see the darker pixels and therefore you want the darken blend mode. What you're saying is show me the darkest pixel. Well, black will always be darker than any other pixel, but the skin tones will all be darker than the white. So rather than trying to do a selection and, and delete the white pixels, all you've got to do is change the blend mode and the white pixels completely disappear. And that then can be moved around to your heart's content or where it looks best on the lady. Poor woman. There we go. So you've got a lot of the blend modes in Photoshop and you've also got some other blend modes that aren't in Photoshop. So well worth having a look at and they work in exactly the same way. So if you've mastered blend modes in Pixelmator, you've mastered them in Photoshop, you are good to go in Affinity Photo. You notice you've not had to shout drink yet. It'll happen. OK, let's have a look at this one, which again, if you've been with us before, you will have seen one of my favorites. It works really well to demonstrate selections because it's a, it's an awkward thing to attempt to select. And that is what everybody seems to want to select, which is hair. And if you're wondering what I'm doing, I'm trying to get this so it's actually an image. Right. Can I ever just drag this up here and open it? That would be good. If you'd let me do that rather than drag it over there. No. Oh, well, it was worth a try. OK. Uh, oh, no, there you go. So this is the background. I would like to uh, show you the lady in the hat and the dress. So let's drag her on here as well and then composite these images. So you can see what I'm aiming for. I'm aiming for dark, mysterious and moody. Um, she's dressed quite rightly for it, but it's quite bright and there's a background. So while it's thinking about opening it for me, I think I've possibly killed this machine tonight. Are you thinking about that? You can see it's hat and dress. So I'm, I'm teasing you with the fact that she's wearing a hat and a dress. And she is and it looks rather nice, but we're not seeing it at the moment. Oh, I love live demos. I really do. There we go. There she is. Right. What I'm going to do with uh, this, I need to make a selection. And there's some really good selection tools. I'm going to use one that you would tend to avoid which is um, the equivalent. This is Flood Select. Um, it's actually, and there's a selection brush as well. I think I'll go for the selection brush. You may have heard it referred to as the tragic wand. And in, in here, it's not bad. It does a reasonable job. All I'm doing as I'm selecting is doing the best job I can. I'm, I'm not being very careful around the edges, not worrying about that at all. You can see it's doing a reasonable job, but it's not going to win any awards anytime soon because it's missing a lot of the hat, uh, it's missed her arm. So I need to make some changes to that. I need to add to the selection. So I need to uh, make sure that that arm's back. I need to sort out the hair and I need to sort out the feather in particular. So what I'm going to do to do that is to invert the mask. So now it's around the lady and I'm going to start adding back what it has missed. So I'm adding the just the bits of the hat that it's missed. Um, I'm adding the arm back. I'm not going to do anything spectacular with the hair because if I do, it's going to start selecting the background. and I don't want it to do that. There's just a little bit of that hat there. Right. That's not a bad selection. But if I show you that selection, so I'm copying and pasting it so it goes on to a new layer. Or I should be. Are you doing that? Are you going to do that for me? Uh, oh, well, don't bother then. Uh, oh, there it's done it at last. There we go. So it's not bad, but it's a little bit too sharp around the hair. That would not work well with something behind it. Um, not too good at all. So let's turn that layer off, turn the background layer back on and let's do something with that selection, which is we have a select menu up here and you can choose to refine the edges of your selection. And if you've used Photoshop, you'll be familiar with this. Uh, what this allows you to do is change that selection, particularly around the hair, in an intelligent way. So all I'm going to do is draw over where there is hair. So right over the edges. Now, what I have done with this is go up to the hat and that didn't end well. Um, it took out some of the hat, but I'm going to do it anyway, just to show you. Uh, we will get a good edge on the hat, on parts of the hat. 
but nowhere near all of it. Um, it will make some of it transparent. So I'm doing a selection around there. And I'm letting go and it's having a good old think about it. And then it will come back with a selection. And that's not bad. There's bits that I don't want. There's bits that it hasn't selected um, that I would rather that it did. So I'm going to try again on those. But all told, it's a much better selection than I could make and much faster than I could make it. I now need to look at that selection in different ways. So at the moment, it's an overlay. That's not the best for, for checking it. If I turn it to black, if I was having that on a black background, that'd be great. That looks fine. Let's have a look at it on white, though. And you can see I start getting transparency in, in the edges of the hat, which isn't great. You can also have it on black and white so you can actually see it. And you can see how intricate that selection of the hair is. But that some of this hat, we do not want deselected like that. So those are the options that you've got there. So what I'm going to do here, let me try and get that bit right there. We don't want that grey bit selected. Let's see what it can make of that. That's a bit better. What I'm going to do is apply it and I'm going to apply it as a selection. And that will apply it to this background layer as a selection. And from there, I can then go in and edit that selection. So what I can do is turn on a quick mask with the Q key and then I can just draw on this to make sure it's got all of the hat. And by me drawing on it, it's making sure that there's no bits that, of that hat that are transparent. Obviously, I'm avoiding the hair. The hair is pretty good and I'm leaving it alone. And then all I need to do, I mean, obviously, the more time I take here, the better it will be. But I'm not going to spend another 20 minutes making sure it's perfect. So it'll do. It'll do. So there's my selection. And again, I'm going to copy that selection. And this time I'm going to attempt to take it into this file, which is the gravestones file. And there it is. So let me move her to one side. And yet I can see through her hair into the background. There's the gravestones or the green. I'm getting her in the right place so we can see the bird. Still looks like a composite, though, because um, it's not dark enough. Her colouring and the background colouring don't match, don't match at all. So what you can do is you've got uh, layers here so I can change the levels of that. So have a look at that there. And oh, you've opened that off screen. That's interesting. Let's drag that back on. There we go. There's the levels. So what I can do there is uh, bring this back in so it's a little bit darker. Actually, let's make it lighter. Let's go the other way. Take the black in. So that's darkening it. And I think what I did with it, which was um, I put a gradient on it. So I added another layer and I used G for the gradient tool. And then I went to get a gradient. I think that was the gradient that I got. I've had trouble with this opening. As you can see, it's closing. Let's go to gradient and uh, see if that'll work. And let's see if I can draw that on here. I actually want that the other way, but uh, we'll go for that and flip it round. Oh, you're not you're not playing nicely, are you? There we go. Let's make it darker. I actually wanted it transparent at the bottom, uh, which it doesn't look like it's going to do. So it's a case of going through these and seeing which ones work better with it. Multiply works quite nicely. That darkens her down considerably. So uh, it now now it's moved it. Come on, bring that in so uh, it matches. Yes, at the top there. There we go. So if I go back over here, she matches that much better now. OK, so I'm looking. We've got a little bit of time left so I can show you some more. There's a favourite that I've got. And, uh, I think I've got to show you this one. Got to show you this one because uh, it's a good demo of what Liquify does. Liquify is something that seems to confuse everybody. Um, I'm going to start off with something simple and then go into something a little bit trickier. So what I'm going to do is close down all of these because um, it doesn't seem to like having quite so many files open. Uh, that's probably not the fault of Affinity Photo. That is probably all the software that I have got running to make the webinar magic happen. So uh, don't think that it's Affinity Photo. It's been working fine all day. So let's get rid of all of these. And that should save us some, some processing power. There we go. 
the last one. Let's close you down. Thinking about it still. Right, so we've now got back to one. So I'm going to show you the easy one first, which is um, this one of the lady. And she's perfect as she is, before anybody starts complaining. I know she's perfect as she is. I'm just going to duplicate this. Um, it's purely to show you the tool, which is I need to change persona. I need to go into liquify. And um, Photoshop's got something similar. Um, you have in here all sorts of uh, tools to do with this. There is the push forwards tool, which is the one I tend to spend most of my time in, or the push left tool. But uh, I'm going to stick with this one and show you that if you push forward, you can push pixels. And what happens is, as I do that, you can see the grid distorting at the bottom. That's the liquefying process. And all you're doing is liquefying pixels. You're moving them as if they were liquid and you're moving them in. And uh, obviously that's what they do with ladies, which is why no real woman lo ever looks like the cover of a magazine. Because, you know, we could make this poor woman look terrible. Uh, I think the last time I did this, I ended up with her arms odd. But there you go. See, this is why. So let's have a look at that. Let's uh, do the apply and have a look at the before and the after. See, she doesn't look bad like that. It's when you compare it to a normal woman. So that is liquefy. Now, the thing with that is it's easy because the background's white. What do you do if you've got a trickier background? And it can work very well on trickier backgrounds. It doesn't always have to be white. So uh, let me get another image, which is this one. These images are quite large. There we go. So again, duplicate that. Now we're thinking about it. And with this one, nothing again, nothing wrong with the lady. Just taken from the most unflattering angle I could possibly imagine for an image. So we're uh, into liquify. And see what we can do on the left hand side of this as we're looking at it. Because as I start moving, yes, her hips will move, but the jacket, the blouse will move as well. Won't actually look that bad, though. And you can freeze areas. So if there's areas that you definitely don't want to move, you have options down here for freezing them. So there is a liquify freeze tool and a liquify thaw tool, which I think are fantastic titles because it's obvious straight away what they do. So uh, I'm just moving in and making this woman ridiculously underweight, for which I apologise greatly, but uh, it demonstrates the tool. And apply to that. And again, when we come out, you can see she looks fine. But there again, she looked fine before. But this is what gives women a complex. There we go. And that's liquify. Now, just one quick thing I want to show you before I finish, which is we've looked at the um, content aware fill and um, the repair things that we do to remove things from photos. And I've actually got a real one. Uh, heaven knows what it'll make of this because it's 70 meg. But uh, let's see what it makes of it. This is a real image that I'm working on and it will probably take me a good few weeks to work on it. But um, this is the scan as it came off the scanner of a very old image. In fact, this gentleman at the bottom here, uh, let me bring up the zoom tool. That's my granddad, my granddad. He'd won the cup. And um, as you can see, it's stained. It's got damage to it. It's it's not good. That it's a huge image. It's 8000 pixels by 6000. It's 52 meg off the scanner. Uh, I'm going to be working on that and fixing it. And what I've done here. Um, I've actually got some repairs that I've already done to it. And what I wanted to show you was just how the tools that you've seen for take, taking things like you know, telegraph poles out, if you use them in a, in a more gentle way, a more refined way, then you can actually use them to repair images like this and the damage to them. So what I've got here, I'm trying frantically to get these layers in the right order. Uh, no, you shouldn't be in there. They should be together. But uh, the repair want should be at the bottom. So I will turn on the repairs. And I've uh, not got all the way yet, but you can see I've not done too badly with it either. So this big crease and crack down the middle and this one going up here I've worked on and some of the other areas of the image, but particularly the, these two, because this was actually in two halves at one stage. So I managed to glue it together for the scan, but it needed a lot of work. And um, all the tools that you've seen me use tonight are exactly the same tools that I used on this. 
Then, because the scanners made it kind of sepia, I did some adjustments on it and uh, got it back to a um, little bit more high contrast. So just because I'm taking telegraph poles out and doing silly things, it doesn't mean that you can't actually use this in a meaningful way and um, save memories with it. So I'm going to head back into... Oh, that's gone to sleep now as well. <laughs> We're having it tonight, aren't we? There we go. I'm back into Keynote. So that was a very quick overview of Affinity Photo. We always want to hear what you want us to cover. And uh, today is no exception. So, so far, we've heard about certain things. If you would like more Affinity Photo, then let us know. But what we have heard about so far is, please, let's have another look at Office 2016 for Mac. We had a look at the preview earlier in the year. Incredibly popular. My most hated YouTube video. I know. I've no idea why. Um, it, it, it's black and white. It's Marmite, I'm afraid. You either love it or loathe it. Uh, people like it, but there's an inordinate number of people who don't like it. So um, check that out. But we'll be looking at Office again. That's what you've said you'd like. So we'll be looking at Word and we'll be looking at Excel and we're looking at PowerPoint. So that we've heard about. But we've also heard about so many other things. Um, just off the top of my head, text editors, uh, one password. Oh, what else we heard about? Um, iPhone apps, Snapseed, all kinds of stuff. And, you know, there aren't enough hours in the day for all of it. So we've come up with a plan. We have a new concept. We have the MacBytes Learning Labs. It's exciting. Right. What we're going to do is we're going to be doing a show. Uh, very, very informal. And it's going to be whatever you want us to cover. So what Mac apps, what iOS apps, what tips, techniques, what do you want to learn? Let us know. And what we'll be doing is they'll either be half an hour to 45 minutes and um, some of them will be impromptu. They'll be they'll be like Periscope. We're live now. Come join us. And some of them will schedule so uh, you can plan your evenings and join us. But what we need to what we need to hear from you is what you want. So to do, for that, we've got a questionnaire which Mike will pop at the link anywhere and everywhere. And um, we've put some suggestions up there, some things like Scrivener and Pages, Numbers, Keynote and all other kinds of things. But if you would like something else, put that in there too. We want to know what you want. Whatever gets the most votes uh, is the first one that we'll do. Now, how can you attend these? Well, you're going to need to have a membership of MacBytes Learning, but there is the community account and the community account is free. So if you go there and you sign up for that account, uh, you will get notification of when we are going live with our MacBytes Labs, our learning labs, and uh, you can join us and you would be most welcome to do so. So just to remind you, I've been Elaine Giles. You can find me all over the Internet as Elaine Giles, but specifically my blog, elainegiles.co.uk. And for long time viewers, <laughs> you'll never guess what. My blog has had more posts in the last two weeks than the last six months. It's not been the greatest of years, as you know, but I'm back on form. There's stuff on the blog. It's amazing. You can also find me on Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Google Plus and YouTube as The Elaine Giles. So thanks for attending. We're now going to head off into Q&A and I may or may not be doing a demonstration of Adobe Connect for others who are joining us. So um, particularly for the people on YouTube, I will love you and leave you and uh, see you next time.